To get an idea of the history of stone walls in the Northeast, it's helpful to learn about why they began to be built, because in light of how long the Northeast has been populated, they are not very ancient at all. The Native American groups living in New York and New England before the Europeans arrived included many different Iroquois and Algonquin tribes. Those that cultivated crops mainly did so in the lowlands and river valleys and did not greatly alter the upland soils, which they used more for hunting and gathering. The Native Americans of the northeastern woodlands did remove some rocks from their agricultural fields and put stones to many uses, but they did not use stones for large-scale construction like Native American tribes in other parts of the Americas, nor did they make long, winding stone walls. When the English and Dutch colonists came in the 1600s, they brought with them a very different system and philosophy of land management. Unlike the Native American combination of hunting, gathering, and agriculture, the colonists were used to raising crops and keeping livestock. They also happened to see enclosing land as an essential part of what makes land settle. The English, for example, often cited the fact that Native people did not enclose their land or stay on it year-round as justification for claiming it. Just like the Native Americans, when the Europeans came, they congregated in the lowlands and river valleys, where soils were relatively stone-free, and used the land for agriculture. Farming and pasture were initially fairly communal among early European settlers, but they still relied on enclosure, in the form of ditches, hedges, and wooden fences, to keep their gardens, fields, and animal pens separate from each other. Tensions were frequently high with the Native Americans, which kept early European settler communities from expanding into new territories. By the late 1600s and early 1700s, however, the abundant land was drawing colonists out of the now crowded population centers of the Northeast to establish new farms in forested areas. This period of increasing private farms in the uplands is when we start to see stone walls being built as boundaries and as parts of fences. At the time, state and town governments were trying their hardest to encourage people to settle and clear more land for farming. A town might offer land for free, as long as the settlers improve the land by clearing its forests. As fencing was seen as a crucial part of the settlement process, fences and walls may also have helped to cement the feeling of truly being settled, safe, and separate from the wilderness for farmers, echoing the tradition of surrounding towns with protective walls back in England. Another reason to enclose land was that, as in the early colonial communities, when half of a town's livelihood is in crops and the other half in livestock, fences become very important for keeping the two apart. As a result, lots of laws were made regarding fences and walls, and many led to an increase in fences. There were many types of wooden fences used in the pioneering years. The first fences on a property were often stumps, brush, and small logs left from clearing the land. At this time, the stones had not been eroded out of the soil or worked up by frost or plowing yet. Except as boundary markers on especially stony ground, walls appeared gradually over generations as the stones showed up. In the pioneering stage of a farm, no matter what century it took place in, the walls most often began as refuse piles, where stones were collected along the edges of farms, often near a wooden fence line, just to get them out of the way. The clearing of forests also played a role in the increase of stone walls over time. An average farm could burn up to 35 cords of wood per year, and towns often had wood shortages within a decade of settlement. Many people turned to stone for at least the bottom halves of their fences, because wood was so valuable. Though they took longer to build, stone walls would have to be replaced less often than wood. As the stone supply began to increase relative to the wood supply, the use of stone walls increased. As is obvious from these quotes from New England agricultural publications, clearing the stones from fields and building fences were still very important in the early 1800s, and by this time deforestation was becoming a serious issue, so stone walls were much more likely to be used than wood for fencing. This was one reason that the period from the Revolutionary War to 1825 saw the greatest boom in stone wall construction. The British naval blockade during the Revolutionary War spurred an increase in manufacturing in the Northeast, which began a period of industrialization that would create a new market for farm goods, the urban population. The British trade embargo of 1808 and high tariffs on imported goods after the War of 1812 further encouraged industrialization. The subsistence farms of the Northeast adapted to these changes by industrializing as well, and by making the shift to farming for market. The 1820s were a peaceful and prosperous time for farmers, when labor was plentiful and there was a high demand for their goods. 
At this time, people took extra pride in being American and being a farmer, and many people began to rebuild or build up their old tossed walls and piles into more aesthetically pleasing stacked and laid walls, both single and double. Though it is important to note that this didn't only happen during this time. The emergence of stacked and laid walls is more dependent on a farm being well established, though this happened for most farms during the period from the American Revolution to the 1830s. However, this golden age for northeastern farmers did not last. Agricultural prices finally crashed in the Panic of 1837. There was a huge boom in transportation technology, and when the Erie Canal was completed in 1825, it brought food prices down as goods were brought in from western New York and the Great Lakes states. Beginning in 1829, railroads began to draw people to the west looking for new farmland and to bring their goods back east, further depressing prices. Market farming also encouraged the building of more and better roads. All of this transportation made transporting produce easier, but it also made moving out of the rocky northeast and out to the west, where topsoil was deep and the land was flat, very tempting. Farmers began to abandon the hilly parts of the northeast to move both out west and to cities to try their luck at other occupations. Those that stayed often had to change their products to tobacco, apples, or dairy, because sheep and cattle for meat could be produced much more cheaply in the west. Industrialization also impacted stone walls because it produced a demand for stone for building and servicing roads, which gave farmers an opportunity to actually sell their field stone walls. By the 1840s and 50s, the stone walls of the Northeast were beginning to be seen as a major problem, because modern farming machines, designed with the landscape of the West in mind, needed large, flat fields. Therefore, it was in a farmer's best interest to make their fields bigger and more level, and this often involved knocking their walls down. The walls that made it through this period often weren't easily accessible enough to be harvested for their stone were unusual or especially beautiful, or still accurately marked property boundaries, and so were left alone. From 1870 onward, after so many farmers had left the Northeast, the forest began to double approximately every 20 years, reclaiming the old farmland and the walls that had been left behind. Most of the farms of the Northeast died off with the Great Depression in the 1930s. Despite the eventual negative effects of industrialization on the Northeastern farmer, this time period was not the end of stone walls in the region. Although finely made stone walls had been commissioned throughout the centuries by rich people or when towns had some extra money, by far the biggest surge in these kinds of walls began with the Industrial Revolution, when better transportation allowed rich city dwellers to set up country homes and eventually to commute. The walls that they had built in the countryside were built for beauty and included such varieties as mosaic and chinked walls. During the mid to late 1800s, many farmers who found that farming wasn't profitable enough made their wall building skills into a livelihood, resulting in a specialized class of stone masons and wall builders. As more immigrants came, they began to take advantage of this market as well. Other landowners hired Native Americans or used the labor of children. It is important to remember that immigrants, Native Americans, children, and also slaves were acting as wall builders long before the boom in wealthy estate walls. In conclusion, the different types of walls that you see today are greatly affected by the stages of development that their farms were in at the time they were abandoned. This is related to who built them and for what purpose.